Trigger warning, if you don't think that battleships, the biggest, heaviest gunned war machines ever built, are really cool, or if you have no interest in the last and greatest battleship confrontations of all time, and you want to keep this a safe space, then here's a video of a cute baby squirrel. Do you know that we're humans? No, no, you don't. However, for everyone else, it's battleship time. So I'm back in England at the moment, and these are some of the models of some of the more remarkable machines made by mankind. And the obvious one is the back there, that's the Saturn V rocket, the thing that put men on the moon in that tiny little bit up at the top there. Um, and in the foreground, you've got a load of battleships. Now, the scale on these things is a little different. In the Saturn V there, it was about 100 meters long, while most of these battleships here were about 200 meters long. So you could have fit, fitted two Saturn V rockets on the deck of these these battleships. And in the day that these, these guys actually sailed the seas, they really were mm, almost super weapons, in that the only thing that could really take on a battleship was another battleship. This was before the days of planes. Um... And so battle was largely decided by you have to have something fast enough that it could catch up with the enemy ship. And if you could catch up with it, then you had to have enough firepower to overcome the enemy's armor quicker than their firepower would overcome yours, because otherwise you just catch them up and they destroy you. Um, and there's some fascinating stories that go with these battleships. So this one here is the Graf Spain. Now at the beginning of World War II, Germans didn't have many ships, but those that they had were very well made and they were very modern. And the Graf Spears may be an example of this. It was actually a relatively small ship. Uh, I think it was about 15,000 tons or something. Um, but for its size, it had a huge range. could travel 10,000 miles or something. Yeah, almost halfway around the world. It had big guns, well, especially for its size. It had six 11-inch guns, that's the, the 11 inches, the diameter of the barrel. And it was fast, to the point where it pro posed a real problem for the British fleet, in that almost the only ships that they had that could catch it, it would destroy. And the only ships that they had that had big enough guns to destroy it, it could outrun. Um... So, the British knew that it was operating in the South Atlantic, so they dispatched a load of hunting groups. And one of the hunting groups was made up of light cruisers like this. This is either Ajax or Achilles, I forget which one. And it was a six-inch um, cruiser, six-inch guns. And they had two of these and one eight-inch cruiser called Exeter. Now, on paper... They were nowhere near a match for Graf Spey. You know, just in a straight shooting match, Graf Spey would basically win every time. But the British didn't need to win. They only needed to damage the Graf Spey because if it was damaged, then it would have to seek a port. And then that would give the rest of the, the British fleet a chance to destroy it. So the plan was that the two light cruisers and the heavy cruiser of the British would split up. So that diverts the, splits the attacking power of Graf Spey. And Graf Spey focused on the, the more serious target, the 8-inch cruiser, and made a mess of it in fairly short order. Um, meanwhile, the two 6-inch cruisers closed on it. Um, and whilst they um, scored a lot of hits, they mostly did superficial damage because the 6-inch shells of this guy weren't really enough to you know, do serious damage to um, a, a ship with as much armor as Graf Spey. Now, it turns out that one of the last shells of the 8-inch cruiser, the Exeter, actually damaged the fuel processing uh, capability of Graf Spey, which, yeah, it didn't impair the immediate fighting ability of the ship, but it meant that it would have to find a safe harbor, and that it did. It went into Montevideo, which was at the time a neutral harbor. Um... Now, the British still had a problem that it was still a functioning fighting ship. You know, if you like it, it had one sort of lucky hit. Um, but, you know, they, they had this problem. Um, how are they going to sink this ship when they, the nearest ships that they had that could catch it and destroy it 
were thousands of miles away. And so they set up this rather elaborate bluff where they sent all these unsecured radio messages suggesting that there are all these heavy, fast ships outside that could both catch and sink the Graf Spey. And the Germans bought it, even though all that was sitting outside was essentially two of these six-inch cruisers. The Germans thought that, you know, if they actually made a run for it, they would just get destroyed. Um, and so they scuttled the Graf Spey. Uh, so it was a battle won more by bluff than by... Uh, tactics or uh, guns or armor or speed or anything. Anyway, so that's the story of the Graf Spey and uh, the Ajax. Now this guy is one of the most famous battleships uh, really ever. It's the Bismarck and again it's a German battleship and it was new at the beginning of World War II and it outclassed really anything that the British had at the time. And so this, again, yeah, the British had more ships, but they didn't have a ship really as powerful as Bismarck. Bismarck could go faster than anything they had. It was a new ship. It had a uh, good ability to shoot straight, um, to shoot accurately. Um, and it was a real problem. Now, the British, it turned out, managed to get an interception with it, with these two battleships behind it. And the guy immediately behind it is the Hood, um, which was, at the time, the pride of the Royal Navy. Uh, it was a World War One era battle cruiser, uh, but it was fast enough to catch Bismarck. There weren't many British ships that could catch it. It had a comparable armament to Bismarck. Um, Hood had uh, eight 15-inch guns. Bismarck had eight 15-inch guns. And it was accompanied with a ship behind it, which is a King George V class. He's missing some of his guns, but um, the King George V class, they were new. They were smaller than Bismarck in terms of displacement. They had smaller guns. They had 10 14-inch guns, uh, as opposed to the 8 15-inch guns on Bismarck. And it was also a very new ship at the time, so um, it had all sorts of mechanical troubles in actually getting to the battle and during the battle itself. Anyway, very early on in the battle, Bismarck um, got a plunging hit. Uh, Hood had relatively thin deck armour because it was a World War One era cruiser and they, they sacrificed armour for speed. So Hood was quite a fast ship but not that well armoured, especially on the deck armour. They got a plunging hit that hit somewhere amidships and that set off one of the magazines and that just blew up the whole ship um, and it sank within a minute or something and there were only three survivors from the hood now um, that really did change the the battle because previously there were two battle these two battleships um, of the British up against the Bismarck uh, now with the hood destroyed it was a one-on-one -on -one battle and further it was something crazy like uh, uh, one of the turrets of the Prince of Wales was out of action from you know just uh, work up mechanical problems and so they retreat they got hit again and retreated under smoke um, now it turns out they sort of won a victory fairly similar to that that was achieved with um, Graf Spey here in that one of the 14 inch shells of um, Prince of Wales penetrated one of the fuel tanks of Bismarck and that gave them a fuel leak which was a big problem for Bismarck on two grounds First of all, it meant that the oil leaking left an oil slick, which was very, made it much easier to find the ship. And secondly, it limited their range of the ship. So again, Bismarck had to seek a friendly harbour for both repairs and more fuel. And in the meantime, since you know, it was absolute catastrophe for Britain at the time, because the Hood was the pride of the Royal Navy, and it was one of the few ships that could actually catch up to Bismarck, and had the firepower to um, seriously damage or sink it. And so Churchill sent out the famous signal, sink the Bismarck. Um, and the British sent out pretty much everything they had to try and sink the Bismarck. Problem was, of course, that by the time they found it, Bismarck um, was almost all the way to a safe French port. And the British had no heavy units, no heavy battleships that could intercept it in time. And so it was a sort of desperation measure that they sent off these strikes of these 
uh, what were they, swordfish biplanes from an aircraft carrier, which carried relatively small torpedoes. And they had several attempts at uh, damaging the Bismarck to hopefully slow it down. And all of the torpedoes that hit in the armoured belt did essentially no damage. The ship was almost indestructible to these small torpedoes that the these biplanes carried. And these biplanes also travelled really slowly. They're only like 150 miles an hour or something. But this was really before the days when the ships could um, had effective anti-aircraft systems. So the crew of Bismarck hadn't really been trained to shoot at planes. And not only that... Um, their guns didn't really train low enough to shoot at these biplanes uh, conducting these torpedo attacks. And further, the gun flashes from the lower guns tended to blind the gun layers from the upper guns, which again uh, made the ship fairly ineffective when it came to shooting down aircraft. And the bottom line is that of all of these biplanes that attacked Bismarck at some really very slow speed, none of them got shot down. Now, not all of them... Uh, all the torpedoes hit, several torpedoes hit, those that hit in the midships did nothing. But it was common for battleships like this to swerve to avoid torpedoes. If you manoeuvre, it reduces the chances of the torpedoes hitting you. Anyway, whilst doing this strong manoeuvre, by chance, one of these relatively small 18-inch um, torpedoes hits Bismarck in the rudder region. It jams the rudder full. You know, it's the worst place you could jam the rudder. And then Bismarck is all of a sudden its position is transformed. You know, no one was really killed by the damage to the rudder, but the ship now essentially cannot maneuver. It can go in circles, and it can't go very fast. A lot of the things um, that determine the naval battles is speed and maneuverability. So almost all of these battles are conducted at about. 10, 15 kilometers range or something. And the muzzle velocity on these guns is its about two times the speed of sound. So 600, 700 meters per second. Which means that a uh, shell fired from these things will go a kilometer in about one and a half seconds. So if these battles are conducted at 10 kilometer range, that means that the, the shells have like a 15 second flight time. And so if your ship can move, you know, maneuver left and right fairly quickly, weave the line, so to speak, it reduces its chances of getting hit by accurate gunfire. Um, so uh, Bismarck is now essentially a sitting duck. It can't maneuver very well, and it can't go very fast. And in the meantime, because it's essentially been steaming in circles, the British heavy units have caught up, which was another of these relatively modern British battleships, called King George V, and an older battleship of the interwar era called Rodney, which carried nine 16-inch guns. And they made a mess of Bismarck in fairly short order. Um, didn't actually really sink it. The, it looks, from most of the reports, that the Germans um, scuttled the ship. I mean, it didn't really make that much difference at this point, because... Uh, the ship had been rendered operationally ineffective as a fighting unit very quickly. Um, and, yeah, so that was the story of the Bismarck. Um, now, over here, there are some... These are... Uh, uh, let's see if we can open that. So over here we have some larger scale models. So the guy in the back is the Scharnhorst, or Gneisnau, who are basically sister ships. And the guy in the front is a King George the Fifth class battleship. Um, now Scharnhorst again was a commerce raider. Very much like Bismarck, it had fairly big guns, just to put it into perspective. The, these turrets are the same, so there's slightly different scales on the Graf Spey and the um, Scharnhorst. But they were triple at... Uh, 11 inch guns, so it had 9 11 inch guns in total um, but again it was fast, it had a good range and they were a big threat to the convoys in that they could in principle turn up, sink all the ships in the convoy at a standoff distance without taking fire from the close escort themselves and then they could retreat um, before the heavy units actually could intercept them 
some. That was the big problem with both Scharnhorst and the Bismarck class ships. So the British spent a huge amount of effort trying to get these ships out of the way. When they were at sea, they sent huge amounts of um, ships after them. When they were in port, they tried to bomb them. They tried midget submarines, anything to keep them out of action. Now, Scharnhorst ended up uh, threatening the Arctic convoys. Um, and in many ways, the Germans tied up a disproportionate amount of resources just by having the ships in existence. Just by having the threat of these things coming out, that meant that the British and later the Americans had to have lots of resources there to uh, just in case they do come out. Anyway, so it was in the Arctic where Scharnhorst made its last uh, sortie and it went out to attack a convoy and the conditions in the Arctic were terrible. They had very bad visibility, frequently you get snow and the such like and it became very difficult to see um, where you were going, what you were shooting at, that sort of thing. Now, in such conditions, radar plays a very big part and this was towards the end of the war and the Germans only had fairly poor radar and the British had very good radar. Now, the Germans had radar but they didn't like to use it because they thought they would it would give away their position. And so what happened is very early on in the battle, the close escort, uh, which tended to be smaller cruisers and destroyers, that sort of thing, the close escort from the convoy that it was attacking, um, in the fog, using radar-laid guns, managed to shell the Scharnhorst, and one of the early shells, by luck, destroyed all of their radar equipment. So after that, they were, they were truly blind in this... Um, really horrible environment for them where the visibility was very low. Now, unbeknownst to Scharnhorst, they persisted in trying to attack the convoy, but in the meantime, uh, the distant convoy cover, their heavy units, which included one of these battleships, a King George V class battleship, um, was closing um, on the Scharnhorst. So the cruisers were staying in radar contact and they were relaying its position to the battleship which was approaching um, uh, with radar silence. Um, and so this ship got within, uh, I think it was about a mile or something, a couple of kilometers before it opened fire. And of course, the first thing that Scharnhorst knew that it was being shelled by a big gun battleship was basically when the shells started splashing down around it. Now, Scharnhorst was actually still the fastest ship and could til still technically get away if it could just have enough time to outrun the range of the guns of the big battleship. And it almost did it. Um, it almost got out of range, but one of the last shells from the King George V class battleship hit the engine room, and the Scharnhorst started to lose speed, and that was basically the end of it. Um, because Scharnhorst's fire was almost completely ineffective, the British had lots of ships in the area and they'd pull all these um, tricks like you get your little ships to fire star shells that land behind the the enemy ship and they silhouette it, which means that it's much easier to lay your guns on them. And at this time the British used, had radar laid guns also. So it was really the end for Scharnhorst. Now Scharnhorst sank in Arctic waters and they're very cold. So almost everyone from the Scharnhorst who went into the water froze, and there was something only like a hundred survivors. So, I mean, you take a look at the survivors from many of these ships, and it really is fairly uh, catastrophic in that the hood, this guy, that blew up with almost the loss of everyone. There were only three survivors from the hood. When the Bismarck was sunk, um, there were comparatively a lot of people who survived the battle. Um, however, of course, the British were the only big ships in the area to pick up survivors. Now, they, the home fleet, it turns out, who were almost at the limit of their fuel when they fought the battle with Bismarck. So the big ships had to retire. Um, and they left behind some of the cruisers to pick up survivors from the Bismarck. But then they got the warning that there were any enemy submarines in the area. And... It's one of these very difficult decisions of war that do you risk um, stopping your own ships to pick up survivors if there is a risk of 
having them destroyed by enemy submarines. Now, I think it turns out that the submarine in the area didn't have any torpedoes left, um, but um, the bottom line was is that the British only picked up about 100 survivors from Bismarck, I think, and then they basically just left left the rest in the water, um, which, you know, on the, on the basis that the enemy submarines or whatever could pick them up, which it, it never happened. So um, out of Hood, there were only three survivors. Out of Bismarck, there were only about 100 survivors. All of these ships had a complement of about 2,000 men, bear in mind, and similarly with Scharnhorst. So those are some of the more fascinating machines made by man.